Good, after Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the third annual College of Arts and Sciences RAF debate. Thank you. Um, I was going to start with the premise of this, but I thought I'd um, announce the incentive first. You're signing when you're coming in for a raffle, and this is a raffle for uh, gift cards of 25, 50, and $100. The names will be chosen at the end of the debate. <laughs> so if you want to see if you've won the raffle, you need to stay to the end. However, from previous years, I have to tell you that people stayed to the end because it got funnier as it progressed. So setting high expectations for the group today. So the premise of the RAF debate is we have 11 professors. They are stranded on a desert island with the chance of only one of them escaping because the life raft only holds one person. Each islander must argue why they, specifically their discipline, is the most deserving of survival because the world depends on it. The winner of the debate will be chosen by you. So after the entire debate, we will ask for applause for each of the islanders to see who wins. The format of the debate is each of the islanders will have three minutes to present their case on why their discipline is most important and should survive. After each islander gave their case, they will then be given one additional moment to then describe why half, after listening to everybody else, they still should be the one to survive. And then we'll vote. Our disciplines represented today are from the Department of Biodiversity, Earth, and Environmental Science. Bees in the audience. Woo! Biology. Yeah. All right. Chemistry. Criminology and justice studies. Woo! English and philosophy. <laughs> Global Studies and Modern Languages, Woo! History, Woo! Mathematics, Woo! Physics, Woo! a little loaded audience, Politics, Woo! and Psychology. Woo! Now, so that we don't, so that there's no bias, I will have members of the audience pulling out the names of who will present next. So I will then be on the floor from now on, and our Islanders will have the stage to themselves. Does this work? Ah, yes, yes. All right. You can talk of bio or chem if med school is your yen, and English if you want to be a debtor. But when it comes to thinking, global studies gives an inkling of what you can do to make the world much better. Ted Cruz tells us that we should bomb incessantly, and Bernie just wants us to get along. But who and what and why? Global Studies makes a try at helping us know who is right or wrong. It's a big, big planet. You need to learn about your place in it. Study in Spain or in Botswana. You know you really wanna. You'll come back wise and knowing more about it. When Donald Trump says, hey, let's make Mexico pay to build that wall or cut off all our trade, or Hillary from state says in the last debate, her policies will increase foreign aid. 
if Obama says that ISIS is really not a crisis and we all need to worry about Greece? It's global studies who, turns the page, will make sure that it's you who understands if this means war or peace. It's a big, big world where flags are oft unfurled. Study in Spain or Kazakhstan. It's really the best plan. And come back with your passport pages curled. What language do you speak? If you don't, well, that's just weak. Global studies means to learn about new ways. You have to know the lingo or you'll be a big, dumb gringo. You'll learn a language and you'll learn it pays. And picking up the culture like some sort of a vulture makes you sophisticated and very, very smart. French wines or Italian shoes, uh, it's you who can always choose. These countries all come to you a la carte. Continents, there are seven. Use them to find your heaven. The whole world now can become your oyster. Study in Spain or Ecuador. That's what airplanes are for. You'll come back wise and not locked in a cloister. I know physics or anthro will say that's where you should go. And they explain the world in a new way. And calm or sociology will help all their students to see the truth. Or so I think that's what they'll say. Historians know the old stuffs. Criminology has the handcuffs. <laughs> and bees will show you how to study bees. Honestly, I have no idea what they study. <laughs> I don't think they do either. But a globalizing earth means that there's a dearth of people who see forest, not the trees. When we all think globally, we set our minds afree. This is where the future is now going. We know you love your nation, but don't live in isolation. Globalization is real and always growing. It's a big, big planet. You need to learn about your place in it. Study in Spain or Mozambique if it's enlightenment you seek. You'll come back wise and knowing more about it. Okay, everyone, look to your right, look to your left. Guarantee one of those people is a psychopath. <laughs> if you don't let me off the island, the psychopaths are gonna be in charge and you don't wanna know what the psychopaths are gonna do. They don't care about you, they don't care about your feelings, they don't care about anything. In fact, think about all the creeps and weirdos that aren't in this room right now. Do you really want the creeps and the weirdos running the show, a bunch of deviants? I don't think so. Do you want them making the laws? Do you want them enforcing the laws? No way. Instead, you need us, criminology, to keep everyone in line. If you don't, your neighbor's gonna be snacking on your brain with some fava beans while he plays with your PlayStation. <laughs> you think a bunch of trigonometry or knowing about molecules is gonna help you when the looters are at your door? I don't think so. You need law, you need order, you need criminology and justice studies. I mean, it's gonna be like Lord of the Flies out there if you don't let me off this island. Who are you gonna to go to when you lose your puppy? The physics department? I don't think so. Who's gonna help you when you're mugged? A bunch of bees? I don't think so. You want us, you want law, you want order. We've got real problems in this country. And no, this is not a Donald Trump rally. We've got mass incarceration, we've got a war on drugs, we've got stop and frisk. Who's got the answers to real problems? We do. This isn't your math homework. This isn't digging in the dirt. This is real stuff. And really, to be honest, if you don't let me off this island, who are you gonna go talk to when your friend gets stopped by the Drexel police with oregano in their glove compartment? <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> great turnout, great crowd. I'm so glad you all came. You'll be able to cheer very loud for me. 
Um, so three dogs meet at the annual International Canine Conference, and they're chatting about various things. And one says, you know, in my country, uh, there's a lot of meat, but we're not allowed to bark. The other says, well, in my country, there's no meat, but we can bark as much as we want. Third one asks, what's meat? What's barking? So what this uh, is meant to illustrate is that there's a lot of variation across countries in terms of how they're governed. You know, in some, people's basic necessities, meat, food, are not satisfied. In others, uh, basic rights, uh, barking, are missing. And in some countries, there's neither of those things. But there's, of course, also the possibility of good governance. And this is where we, the political scientists, come in. We have thought long and hard about optimal governance, and we have a lot of good things to say about this. Of course, the problem is people don't listen. Everyone thinks that they have expertise in sports and politics, right? Well, we know this is not true. Look at how often the public votes incompetent bad leaders into office who then give politics a bad name, right? And this is why if you ask some people what politics means, they, they think, well, it's probably derived from a word poly, meaning many, and ticks, uh, which is what? Blood-sucking parasites, right? <laughs> Or, to quote another great thinker of our times, John Stewart, if con is the opposite of pro, then isn't Congress the opposite of progress? Right? <laughs> so if we don't want this kind of politics, if we don't want this to happen, what we need, if, if we want a robust democracy, is politically well-informed citizens, and that's where political scientists can help. So if you don't want Trump to be the next president, if you don't want the country to go to the dogs, then save the political scientists. Uh, second quick point, I don't know if you guys noticed, but on the ad, all the islanders are depicted with things that they hold things that characterize their disciplines. Of course, uh, I hold cuddly stuffed animals, right? <laughs> Uh, one is a donkey, one is an elephant. You might think that means, you know, Republicans and Democrats and politics, but that's not true. The deep meaning here, let me flash it out for you, the organizers are trying to convey this. Political scientists are good people. They like cuddly, stuffed animals. So if you like good people, you don't want to live in a dog-eat-dog -dog world, then what do you do? You save the political scientists. So you rem remember this to summarize. If you don't want Trump to be the next president, if you like puppies, stuffed or otherwise, <laughs> save the political scientists. Thank you. Just taking a minute to see who's getting five points on the next exam. <laughs> All right. Well, let's see if I can defend mathematics. Let's just start off with physics. Force equals mass times acceleration. Energy equals mass times the square of the speed of light. Voltage equals resistance times current. Guys, that's just is math. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Chemistry. Chemists like to go ahead and study balanced chemical equations. I mean, equations, that's math. Who better to do math than a mathematician? Biology. Biologists like to study sequences. Mostly gene sequences now, but not always. See? Biologists can go out and study the number of petals on a daisy. And when they do, they find out that some have two, some have three, some have five, some have eight, some have 13. These aren't random numbers. This is a sequence. And who better to study a sequence than a mathematician? Biodiversity, earth, and environmental science. I'm going to credit my gateway students this morning for this because on the board, I left a logistics equation on the board. And they asked me, what? in the world does that mean? And I said, oh, that's the mathematical model for the number of fish in a pond. Who better to know the number of fish in a pond 
and figure out a mathematical model for it than a mathematician. Global studies and modern language. Well, the globe is a small little part of a much larger universe. And a lot of my pre-calculus students ask me, what's the difference between degrees and radians? And I tell them, when we meet the aliens, I promise you, they are measuring their degrees in radians. <laughs> because the ratio of the circumference of a circle to its diameter is pi. So we can talk globally, we can talk the universally, if we want to talk universal. History, they study events. They put the events on a timeline. What's the timeline? It's a great big giant number line. Who's better to study a number line than a mathematician? Political scientists. They study groups. Oh, group theory. Who's better to study groups? And somebody knows group theory than a mathematician. Psychology. They like IQ numbers. They give IQ tests. An IQ test is nothing but a number. Who better to study numbers than a mathematician? Who did I miss here? Global, history, math, physics, politics, chemistry, criminology. Innocent until proven guilty. That sounds like a null hypothesis and an alternative <laughs> hypothesis. That's statistics. Who better to go study statistics and a mathematician? And finally, we have English and philosophy. I've got to go to Galileo here. And I'm going to paraphrase Galileo when he said, if I had it to do all over again, and he's quoting Plato, who I believe is a pretty famous philosopher, said, I'd study math because it's all about math. this up and get my prop. Hold on. Okay. <laughs> okay. Here's the thing, guys. If 11 of us were stranded on a desert island with only one opportunity for escape, do you really think the best way to handle that is debate about who gets to survive? I mean, that might be something that my colleagues in politics, just for example, would do. But really, is that our best option? Doesn't that just bring out the ugly in people? Someone level-headed and objective, such as myself, a psychologist, would suggest that we can consider the assets and liabilities of each islander and identify the person who's most deserving. So I've taken the liberty to do that. And I'll share with you some of my research today. So my research centered around one question. Who has a skill set that advances humanity, fosters well-being, and maybe even saves some lives? Now clearly some sort of healer would be worthy of that seat. So I asked, is there a doctor or a nurse on the island? Nope. How about a midwife? No. Does anyone on this island have a skill set that is useful to humanity? Then I looked at my reflection in the water, and I said, wait a minute, <laughs> what about you, Nancy Lee? I mean, psychologists study the very essence of what it means to be human, and they employ techniques to advance human well-being. So listen, I don't mean to make my fellow islanders feel bad, especially in the hours before their untimely deaths, <laughs> but psychologists study what goes on in here. Yes, this is an actual human brain, that I happen to have with me on the desert island. <laughs> now, what islander could possibly be more deserving of a seat on the life raft than one who studies the very essence of what makes us human? So the great Emily Dickinson once said, the brain is wider than the sky. And I think she really got this right. So you might wonder, well, should someone with a gift for poetry or prose, such as someone from the English or philosophy department, get on the boat? And to that, I say no. Because the thing is, what made Emily Dickinson so talented is the thing I'm holding right here. You might wonder, well, what about some, un some other great minds? Physicists have Albert Einstein in their lineage. But what made Albert Einstein brilliant? 
this thing. One other discipline I carefully considered was biology, not only because it's the dean's discipline, but also because some biologists study the brain. So I thought about it, and biologists study the amazing brain in a way that reduces it to a lump of cells, chemicals, and electrical impulses. That reductionist way of looking at the brain really doesn't seem worthy of a seat on the life raft. So in the end, we need to face the facts, guys. Psychologists study the most important thing, and we've actually got some practical skills too, something that's sometimes hard to say about other academics. So, for example, got a fear of being stranded on a desert island with 11 of your professors? We can help you with that. Sad that your professors didn't make off the island before their untimely deaths? We got you covered. So audience, I leave it to you. The choice is yours. Choose wisely. First of all, I have great respect for my colleagues, but I do have to ask you to do what is best for humanity and vote the bees representative off of this island. You know, it's all about learning and then applying useful knowledge. Although, you know, we humans are, we're a relatively frail and really not very good looking primate, the present company accepted, um, but we've managed to be a wildly successful species on Earth. And we've done that because we've adapted and we've learned and applied useful knowledge. And that's what we do in bees. Every organism on Earth needs to adapt to survive. And for humans to survive, you're going to have to bring us back off of, bring someone from bees back off of this island. So what do we do that is useful knowledge in bees? You know, what, is the, what adaptations do we figure out? Well, first of all, we understand time, serious time in bees. Most of the others on this stage really can't look back more than a couple of hundred years, maybe a few thousand years to look at their discipline. We can look back billions of years, and that's, that's very useful. There's a, an axiom that the present is the key to the past, but guess what? The past is the key to the future, so the more we can see in the past, the better for the future. It's a great perspective to understand extinctions, to understand climate change, to understand natural disasters like volcanoes and earthquakes and floods. We need this perspective. We also integrate Earth systems. We all know about the geosphere and the biosphere and the hydrosphere and the atmosphere. But guess what? We need to understand how those things interact. And that's what bees folks do. They look at things in a holistic way and we understand the complex integrated systems on Earth. We also understand useful resources on Earth. Who here, well, we understand soil, so who likes food? Anybody? Anybody like food? Good, excellent. Um, we understand fuel, so who likes energy? Anybody like cars or cell phones or air conditioning? I think those are good things that you don't want to do without. But you get the point, you know, water, whatever it may be, we're the key. So we also, the last useful piece of knowledge I want to mention is an evolutionary perspective on the world. Change is the norm. We're always going to have change. Life will change and ecosystems will change. We understand the interconnections of those things. So it's really important. So the work in bees builds on producing critical, useful knowledge in the world. And honestly, we really need it. The clock is ticking. But if I can get off this island and do our work, we can make Earth great again. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So I'm not even sure why we're debating, because I think that the choice is incredibly clear. Biology needs to be off this island, and in particular, I need to get off this island. <laughs> so there are a lot of reasons for this. I have three points to make. The first thing I think you need to think about when you're voting is what you will lose if you lose biology. 
Biology is the fundamental study of all life from the tiniest little creatures to giant ecosystems. We incorporate everything. The other thing that you need to think about is what will you lose if you lose biology as a field? Think about some of the more important things that are especially important to college students. Where would we be without advances in yeast? Would you have beer? Probably not. Where would, we have, where would we be if we didn't understand the basics of baking, how to make things rise? You wouldn't have really delicious croissants in the morning. All of those things are really, really important. What else is really important to college students? Well, I could think of some other things. We understand the fundamental nature of sex. It's really important to vote for us so that we can study those things. Now that's the first point that I have to make. The second point I have to make is if you put me on this raft, I'm a special kind of biologist and I can help everybody. So I brought some things with me to show to you. I am a primatologist and I study chimpanzees. Chimpanzees make tools. These are actual chimpanzee tools and there are various things here. This, if you guys want to see it afterwards, this is a honey wand. This is a spear for hunting termites, and this is one for looking for subterranean ant mounds. So if you put me on that boat, I will be able to find food for myself and survive. And that brings up the other reason that you need to vote for biology, which I'll dig out of my bag here. I brought a lot of evidence with me today. And that is, most importantly, Everybody's field is really important. Biology is all about unity, and I'm really a big believer in that. But the most important thing is I'm a field biologist. This is my uniform that I wear every day when I'm out in the rainforest, and I have advanced global positioning system <laughs> skills. So I can come back, and I can save all of the other disciplines. So if you vote for me, I will save everyone. Thank you. I appreciate the stories that my colleagues have told. I hope to show you how narrow and as important as they are, quite limited, and how they are really the reflections of the one true story that is history. I want to take you back, oh, excuse me, I should say that I, we were asked to bring props, and I commend, that's really cool props. Uh, I brought one, but um, he's with me here, uh, and I'd like to introduce the, the Dread Pirate Lard. And uh, the Dread Pirate Lard will have some things to say a little bit later about story. If you I uh, refer you, this is not, I make it up, refer to the poster. History is story. If you go back to the earliest formation of human society, it's about people telling stories to one another. These stories were not idle. They were the most crucial aspects of their existence. And those stories led to the permanence of tradition. Those traditions are what binds us today in a civil society. And if you think that today's civilization is in danger, as all evidence does show, and is that history, using its methods and its way, the way that it builds story, is the only thing that is going to save the world. So bring me off this island and bring me into society today, into civilization, and I can tell you the kinds of stories that will unite that will be able to gather up the torn fabrics of today's society and civilization and weave them again into a strong tapestry that bonds us all together and that will provide and has always provided the background and foundation for the kinds of stories that my colleagues here have told today. Now, method is important because it's not one story. It's many stories. History is about how to tell the stories and how to get everybody to tell their own story in the way that is important to them. How to also evaluate those stories to, to preserve them over time. And so all this talk about stories uh, reminds me of one 
that relates to my good friend, the dread pirate Lard. My name is Lloyd Lard. So, I hate to stand in front of you with this terrible, disformed body. You may look down at my peg leg, in my hook of a hand, in my dug, gouged out, patched eye. You may ask yourself, like many do, where did you get these dreads, pirate lard? Well, I'll tell you. Me leg, I was at the high seas, and a shark bit it right off. And that's how I got me peg leg. Then I was dueling with a scallywag who cut off my arm, and I got me hook. Well, what about the eye? A little fly flew into my eye. A little fly? Yes. Well, how did that take? It was my first day with the hook. Okay, I've got my props here. All right, my role today is to tell you how chemistry can save society. But actually, I'm going to highlight a little story about how you probably have already been saved by chemistry and, and may not know about it. And it deals with our friend here, which is nitrogen. We have each one of these uh, nitrogen atom with three bonds between the three of them. And nitrogen is necessary for all things to live. But that nitrogen like this that makes up 80% of the atmosphere around you is pretty useless biologically. It's got to be fixed nitrogen, which is nitrogen attached to hydrogens or oxygens. Here I have a nitrogen with three hydrogens around it. And this is the type of nitrogen that we can actually use. So uh, to kind of continue this, we've got to think back to the turn of the 20th century. Around the year 1900, it was the end of the Industrial Revolution. Populations were booming as people moved into cities. And around 1920, we were going to hit an Earth population of about 2 billion people. Well, it turns out with agriculture at the time, we, the Earth was going to be able to support about 2 billion people, which means that we were going to hit a point where we were going to go through massive starvation. We wouldn't be able to feed all the people who are on the planet, and we were going to have a worldwide famine and people die off. Fortunately, chemistry came along. So there was Fritz Haber, a German chemist, who figured out how we could take this nitrogen out of the air that's pretty much useless and turn that into ammonia which then we could use for fertilizers. And this happened just in the nick of time, about 10 years before we were to hit that capacity of how many people we could save on the Earth. Currently, we are at a population of about 7.5 billion people, give or take, when really the Earth's carrying capacity is about 2 billion people. We're able to feed many more people than would otherwise be possible. And also, most of you have some clothing on that's got cotton, which wouldn't be possible to grow the cotton that we need to clothe ourselves without chemistry and without the Haber process. And so, really due to chemistry, we've been able to feed and clothe the people on the planet. And if we kind of think about that and compare those numbers, we've got 11 of us up here on the stage. And without this development of Fritz Haber, only about three of us would be alive today, which would make this debate a little bit easier. But we can think about the loss that we would have without all these wonderful faculty members and the contributions they've made. And also we can think about how hard life would be. That without chemistry, we would have to scramble and struggle for every scrap of food in order to survive. With that, we cannot do what we'd like to do as a society. We would have no governmental structure. We would not be able to create art or investigate relationships as we do or to study the depths of the human mind. So it is chemistry that has allowed us to do this over time. We are about to hit another plateau. Now we think the Earth can probably support about 10 billion people, which we're going to hit about the year 2100. So without chemistry, we will not be able to see these other marks and figure out how to solve those problems. Chemistry allows us as a society to survive and solve the problems that come up for us. All right, thank you.
to escape on this raft, we cannot behave like a bunch of cattle. It's 2016, folks. We should settle this in a rap battle. For those of you who don't know what battle rap's about, just imagine Hamilton and leave the music out. <laughs> now, for getting off this island with a restart for humanity, it's clear that no humanities will get a human through this sea. It's the history that you pass along, or some well-formed, perfect sentences won't matter if you don't know what the buoyant force on rubber is. Should society have discussions that are blunt or indirect? The only ones that question helps are the politically correct. And psychology, well, that will help you understand exactly what you're thinking as you observe objectively that your raft is slowly sinking. <laughs> and criminal justice, who wants to go on with a subject whose very name is an oxymoron? <laughs> so that leaves us what? Mathematics and the sciences. Well, that's the next group, this physicist silences. Take these folks in math, the first thing they insist is a proof that their mapping to the raft is unique, if it exists. <laughs> the biologists are stuck trying to memorize the name of the process that lets proteins transport water through membranes while the people in, while the people in eco want to peephole to see through to count all the species in water. What good's that gonna do? And if you're partial to smells, well, that's the only reason to pick chemistry. They think it's pure because it's organic. <laughs> they think it's easy because it's elementary. But physics, that's the discipline that really trains your mind. It's the thing you have to cultivate to save all humankind. We have few enough equations, you can fit them on a shirt. <laughs> it's the thinking that transforms them to the rules that make things work. We can make predictions that are accurate as need be. We can build equipment out of duct tape <laughs> to get across the sea, put the focus on what matters, just essentials are included. We can contemplate the rest once humanity's rebooted. Take my advice and vote for physics before you end up in the drink. The bottom line is that physics is the best to help a person think. Okay, the first thing I want to do, I'm here representing philosophy, and I want to leave you off the hook. You don't have to vote for me. Because if you vote for any of these lovely people up here on the stage, you will have voted for me, because each one of these is a product or child of philosophy. Politics was Hegel or Aristotle, right? Math, Pythagoras. Psychology, Kant or Hume. Every single one of these disciplines is a product of philosophy. Now, philosophy does something that none of these other ones purely does, which it teaches you how to reason. And reason is the most important thing you will ever undertake in your life because it's what makes your life your own. Now, we can love all these people, and I think we should love all these people, but sometimes they go off track. And without philosophy, they might get lost. So, not to disparage anyone, but there was this period in the middle of the 20th century when psychology lost its way and went into Skinnerism and box and all this sort of stuff with mice. But philosophy kept asking the question, what is mind? What is mind? What is mind? And now we have a new discipline called neuroscience in which psychology attempts to answer the question, what is mind? Now, the other thing I want to tell you is philosophy will do something for you that none of these people can even possibly do. It will let you know yourself. The first premise of philosophy is know yourself. And we give you the techniques to do this. We give you the ability to inquire. We give you the ability to think. 
We give you the ability, most importantly, to question, because there's no point having an answer if you haven't got the question right yet, all right? And the other thing to consider, though, is that you might want to save philosophy, because philosophy is the one that brings you new things, that brings new questions, that makes life more interesting. So another way to look at it is if you save philosophy, you've saved all these people as well. Just a thought. Thank you. One thing all my colleagues have in common is they all go out there and they make observations. And we observe things all the time. But the question is, when we're observing something, is it mean something or is it nothing but noise? Is what you observed nothing but chance? And the only way we can take what we actually know means something and differentiate it from a random thing that's just up to chance is to use statistics. And I'm telling you all, use statistics, don't leave your decision up to chance, make it mean something, and put me in the boat. Okay, guys. You let anyone else off this island, they're going to give you homework. <laughs> I got something they don't have. You don't buy law and order? Let me tell you about crime. We know how to get away with it. We've seen the crime scenes. We've done the analysis. We know where the bodies are buried. Trust me, you want to come to us. You know what else I heard? Medical marijuana, it's coming to Pennsylvania. Who do you think knows where to get the good stuff? Crime and justice. And lastly, if you don't let me off this island, I will shiv every last one of you. Wow, I liked hearing all about my colleagues, especially about the medical marijuana. That is actually pretty convincing. So I'll tell you what, let me make a deal with you. If you let me off this island, I promise you, number one, I will make sure you have beer forever. <laughs> number two, I will navigate back here to this island and save all of these other disciplines, but I will wait for a little while so that you won't have any homework or exams for quite a long time. And that could even be part of me letting them off the island. There's no more homework, just the things to think about. But I do love all of these disciplines and that's the most important thing about biology. We're all about the unity of life and we're all about discovering what makes you, you. And we can go and we can study everything on this planet. So please save biology. Thank you. Okay, well, so I don't mean to throw my other islanders under the boat, but let's just focus on criminal justice. Do you want this thug <laughs> representing humanity? I mean, he's a criminal dressed up as a police officer. <laughs> Psychology is really what the essence of humanity is about. And ultimately, I think we can all agree that children are the future. And as a child psychologist, <laughs> I think that I am the most appropriate islander to get on that raft. Thank you.
two things. Philosophy doesn't just mean love of wisdom. It means the wisdom of love. And if you want to be good lovers, you want to save <laughs> philosophy. The other thing is that philosophers don't really do well when faced with crowds that are voting on them. So if all else fails and you don't vote for me, I will drink this hemlock and it will be on your consciences. Thank you. You guys have all seen the uh, Hunger Games, right? You're familiar with the totalitarian government there. You don't want that, right? Uh, remember, no matter how much scientific progress we make, if we cannot govern responsibly with nuclear weapons and everything, we just blow it all up, destroy it all. A minor point to my fellow islanders. I'm from Transylvania, so you want me off the island. <laughs> Audience, we can do this the easy way or the hard way. You can <laughs> cheer for me or what we can do, remember I'm a political scientist, so I'll just uh, rig the rules, the voting rules. Uh, I will disenfranchise those of you I suspect would not cheer for me, and I will win anyway. So I trust that you're wise and you do the right thing and you'll save political science. Thank you. Although I am impressed by my fellow Islanders, especially the strip tees and the rap, um, I'm, I'm unswayed away from chemistry. Uh, some of you may be as well. You may be thinking, well, you know, I've been put on a few pounds lately, so maybe that global famine might not be so bad. Or it's been a long winter, people have had a lot of clothes on, maybe you already see some skin, and so that fabric's not existing that chemists have put forth, and maybe that appeals to you, but whatever your uh, choice there. I would actually like to endorse another candidate. If you don't choose chemistry, you've got to think about how to survive the post-apocalyptic hellscape that the Earth is going to be without enough food and clothing. Um, and so actually I'm going to throw my uh, weight behind Zoltan Political Science because you will need to know which warlord to pledge your allegiance to <laughs> in order to survive in a world without chemistry. And so I think he may be a good choice for that. So, all right, thank you. So, you know, I, I think all of my panel and fellow islanders up here are, are a good example of how humans have tended to put ourselves in a bubble. We don't realize that there's a whole world out there. We, we think of humanity and we think of all these bits and pieces about our history and our, our criminal systems and all the rest and our politics. But we're connected to much more than that in the world. And it really, it, it's damaging to us and it's damaging to our survival if we don't see the interconnections, and that's what we do in bees. We're looking at the interconnections of the world, and hopefully not only us, but everything else in the world can survive as well. So it's not just, you know, us, but we're going to make sure everything is, makes it through. So thank you. I'm going to have to move fast. Criminology comes looking like a stripper on his way to a cut-rate bachelorette party. <laughs> Political science, dogs, ticks, donkeys, elephants. It's a zoo, and I don't think you should mention all those animals. And then the Hunger Games, I'm not sure what's going on there. Math, boring. <laughs> Psych, criminology warns us the room is full of psychopaths, and she shows up with a brain in a jar. <laughs> Bees, I'm pretty sure he just called you all primates. Bio, I think she called you all primates too. History's making pirate voices desperate. Kem holds up Fritz Haber as a model. He also led the team that developed chlorine gas for use during poison gas warfare during World War I. Physics, did he just call you cattle? And philosophy, I want to quote Homer Simpson, which I think is probably appropriate for the philosophy department. What is mind? It doesn't matter. What is matter? Never mind. <laughs> Frank 
in case my case wasn't stated with full clarity, here is some recapitulation from the folks who brought you gravity, <laughs> who figured out that matter behaves like a wave. This is the discipline you need to save. We've got Schrodinger's cat. We've got Einstein's twins. We've got black holes that swallow whatever goes in. We invented holography, we discovered x-rays, we came up with a microscope that functions on phase, we invented the laser, we, in, we solved the first protein structure, we devised the transistor, discovered superconductors. And I may not watch a lot of TV, but I've never seen a show called the DNA Theory. <laughs> These other guys, they're good for a laugh. Physics is the one that belongs on the raft. didn't listen. It's about story. Whether you're going to look in a universal perspective, when we meet the aliens, we're going to talk about who we've been and who they are, and we're going to put it together and in one story. But it's, again, it's about method. It's all stories. And there are different kinds of stories. And uh, my friend here is going to help us to understand that. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Eckert. Um, I'd like to ask the audience a question, if I might. What's a pirate's favorite color? <laughs> Orange. <laughs> What's a pirate's favorite physics particle? Quark. <laughs> Does that always work? Nah. I once had a friend, Scallywag she was, and uh, she didn't think it was about saying R. She thought it was just being loud. So her joke was, what's a pirate's favorite food? Hot dog.
Now, I hope that the reason that most of you are still in the audience is because you had a good time. So if you had a good time, could I have a round of applause? Right. Here in the College of Arts and Sciences, we want you to learn a lot. We want you to be successful when you leave, but we want you to have a good time getting there. And I hope you're doing it. All right. I will ask our winner to draw the, the $25. Well, no, you should do the 100 Okay.